everybody. A great one today, you know, for a change. Representative Katie Porter is with us to talk about her fun new book, I Swear Politics is Messier Than My Minivan, and about her candidacy for U.S. Senate in California. Porter, of course, represents part of Orange County, formerly a a solidly red county, now purple. She won her district in 2018 and 2020. In redistricting, it was made uh, more difficult for her in 22, but she pulled it out. So she can win in tough districts. California, of course, not tough for Democrats in the U.S. Senate race, and she's up against some tough competition. Adam Schiff, from the Hollywood area of California, well known for its uh, prominent role in the entertainment industry. Barbara Lee, who represents Oakland, California, only member of the House to vote against the war in Afghanistan. So I'm not endorsing anybody, but of course, Katie Porter, a great member of Congress with a wonderful sense of humor and a single mom with three kids and hence a very messy minivan. I know you really enjoy our discussion, you know, for a change. Instead of doing a a monologue this week, I decided to invite Jeremy Peters of the New York Times, who joined us a a few weeks ago to talk about the Dominion case against the uh, Fox News Channel, which uh, he had uh, been covering for the paper and still is. And we know how that turned out, but I want to get his perspective on the settlement, but also on the cases Fox will be facing going forward. Of course, there's the Smartmatic case. Smartmatic is a voting software company about whom several Fox hosts, Maria Bartiromo, Janine Pirro, Lou Dobbs, helped spread false claims that Smartmatic had been the software in the Dominion machines that changed Trump votes to Biden votes, stealing the 2020 election. Smartmatic filed a $2.7 billion defamation suit against Fox for knowingly spreading these false claims. Now, one of my favorite aspects of the suit is that Smartmatic was not the software in the Dominion voting machines in question. In fact, Smartmatic says its software is rarely used in the United States and in the 2022 midterm was only used in Los Angeles County in California. So we'll talk with Jeremy about that case as well. One last thing, and I'll read this straight from the Washington Post. My pillow founder and prominent election denier Mike Lindell made a bold offer ahead of a cyber symposium he held in August 2021 in South Dakota. He claimed he had data showing Chinese interference and said he would pay $5 million to anyone who could prove the material was not from the previous year's U.S. election. He called the challenge, Prove Mike Wrong. On Wednesday, a private arbitration panel ruled that someone did. The panel said Robert Zeidman, a computer forensic expert and 63-year-old Trump voter from Nevada, was entitled to the $5 million payout. Zeidman had examined Lindell's data and concluded that not only did it not prove voter fraud, it also had no connection to the 2020 election. He was the only expert who submitted a claim, (laughs) arbitration records show. He turned to the arbitrators after Lindell Management, which created the contest, refused to pay him. (laughs) Anyway, Katie Porter will be joining me after a brief discussion with Jeremy Peters from the New York Times. We've got a doubly great one today, you know, for a change. Uh, 787.5 million that's that's the settlement right that's a lot of money yes that's right it's the biggest defamation settlement that we know of and well deserved it uh, it certainly does send a message i mean you don't know that dominion would have been able to get money like that from a delaware jury and in fact i had heard that the judge in the case urged both sides to settle this one of his points was 
look, you know, this is Delaware. It's a, it's a small state and those kind of damages, um, you know, you may, you may not necessarily have a, 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 a jury, even if you get a friendly jury, they might not, they may not award that. And then Dominion also doesn't have to worry about this getting knocked down on appeal. Cause a lot of times, as you know, these settlements, big settlements, especially get, get reduced. And Fox had every intention of appealing this case as far as they could take it. And then that can go on for years and years, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the chief legal counsel at Fox News had uh, had told people that he thought that this could go to the Supreme Court uh, as a First Amendment case. Now, I don't know if that would have happened, but like that's how far down the road they were looking. Right. And uh, it really is a First Amendment case just to begin with the original ruling. What was what was the original ruling? The original ruling was actually uh, uh, New York the, the, Times, right? Yeah, yeah, New York Times uh, v. Sullivan, yeah, um, which said you, you and me in the in the media can make mistakes, but they just have to be honest mistakes. Like you know, the the, the idea was in a in a healthy democracy to have a, a, a functioning and free press, they have to have the breathing room to make an occasional mistake. Yeah, and and you have to prove that that. Uh, it was done with malice, and <laughs> it, it, it's a high standard to beat. It's a really high standard to beat, yeah, because you have to like get inside people's heads. Um, and uh, you know, Dominion was able to do that. I mean, we we have a like this 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 remarkable um, volume of discovery in this case that has emails and texts um, back going back and forth between Rupert Murdoch and his CEOs, and, and and of course, and I think everybody has has you know heard a lot of those and Tucker Carlson stuff, and and they had it. It felt like they had it, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, Fox, uh, I can tell you, would have been very surprised to win this trial in Delaware. The trade-off probably was, OK, we don't have to put our people up on the stand. We don't have to have Tucker Carlson on the stand. We don't have to have all these people on the stand. Now, this was not going to be televised, but still it would have existed. <laughs> they would have been cross-examined. And it would have been ugly. So that was yeah, it would have been ugly, especially Tucker Carlson. And I can tell you because I talked to you know the Dominion lawyers about what their plans were for the for the trial, and they were going to have a lawyer um, by the name of Davida Brook who had you know done, conducted a lot of the depositions. She was going to do Tucker Carlson uh, on the stand, and, and the thinking there was you want to have a woman questioning him about all these misogynistic texts that he had sent, you know, calling Sidney Powell every kind of vulgar crass name in the book, um, which uh, I won't repeat on your show, but you can imagine <laughs> what some of those were. Yeah. And that would have been, and that's why everybody um, is, is so disappointed in a dominion. But if you're dominion, uh, $787.5 million in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, 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 it's not just that, though, because like, yeah, they have the money. Um, and, you know, as one of their lawyers said, and I think this is right, money is a form of accountability. But, at the, you know, at the same time, think of all we know now about Fox, like how exposed Fox is and how we can see the disingenuousness which with which they operate. I mean, it's kind of stuff that we we long suspected, you know, that they they, they, they are just telling their listeners this, this story this, that they want to hear. Well, now we have proof of that. Yeah, you know, all the discovery that we we've heard about, uh, it was played about as dumbly as possible by Fox. They should have probably settled long long ago before all this discovery, right? And I bet they could have settled for a lot less than seven hundred and eighty-seven million dollars, right? All right. So we know what happened there. I I do want to look forward to Smartmatic, and I don't know how much uh, you've done in, in researching that. But here, here are a couple of things that, uh, first of all, they're suing for a lot more, right? It's like 2.7 billion or something. Yeah. And, and that case is in New York, um, which is why, because, uh, you know, as we learned with the Trump indictment, when the judge said, OK, we'll see you in December, um, <laughs> the courts in New York are so backlogged that that's not going to trial for another two years if it goes to trial. And I think really yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, oh, I it's, did it's not way know that. far out there. So that's plenty oh, of time to settle. I'm so disappointed. <laughs> that, how about their discovery? I mean, does that mean their discovery is not going to get out uh, for, I assume they've been doing that or have they not? 
they've been doing that and they've been using, as far as I understand it, um, a lot of Dominion's discovery because there's a lot of overlap in the two cases, uh, as, as, as you can imagine. Yeah. Now, now, uh, Bartiromo and Perot and Dobbs talked a lot about Smartmatic, right? Yes, I, that, that, that's right. And Fox actually, in a sign of how worried they were about the stuff that they put on their air about Smartmatic, they actually clarified. Um, I don't know if it was an on-air correction, but it was this very bizarre statement that was read by this you know disembodied voice on the air um, about um, Smartmatic machines. And that shows you that they were worried about a lawsuit. I What I understood is that Smartmatic... Uh, was only in one uh, yeah. county. Exactly right. Los Angeles County. Los Angeles County. So Smartmatic was not the, either the software for any of the Dominion machines that were being challenged by everybody, right? So Lou Dobbs and Maria Bartiromo and Janine Perot were going like, these were Dominion machines and Smartmatic software in uh, stole these elections <laughs> in, in, in one in Los Angeles. And then I mean, because Smartmatic is an international provider of this of this technology. Right. Like so they're in like Honduras. They're in Central America. They're in Germany. They're in the Netherlands. They're all over the place. Well, that makes you know, it more suspicious, of course. Of course. <laughs> I mean, that's that's really suspicious. Well, right. Because remember, they were sending uh, <laughs> the, the story there. The conspiracy theory was that they were um, counting American votes overseas and like, re rerouting them through places like China and Germany. And like, yeah, I mean, it was Italy. It was crazy Italian stuff. satellites uh, were, were sending. Uh, and, were, were changing and Soros votes. was ca was doing the counting himself from Hungary. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and, and doing it in Hebrew. <laughs> I, so, oh, so I, I did not know this. So smart, the Smartmatic case will not be coming up for a long time. Goddamn New York. I know. Right? Fucking backlog. <laughs> yep. Uh, so don't get your popcorn out yet. Jesus Christ. Oh, this is so disappointing. I was hoping for the Smartmatic case too. So we may, we won't know that till after the next election. Probably. That's right. Yeah. Oh, well, well, thanks for getting us, for disappointing us once again. <laughs> <laughs> 787. I'm wondering how much is, is a company like Dominion worth in the first place? We know that the size of the settlement, 787.5 million, is about 10 times. Um, what the private equity company that has a controlling stake in it paid. This is a big windfall, not just for uh, for Dominion, but for the uh, the hedge fund that, that that controls it and the uh, the lawyers who argued the case. The ca the company paid one tenth of the settlement for the company, roughly. Okay, so it's now worth uh, one point. One times the settlement. <laughs> 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 At least. Because it got a rep. You know, I always thought, it's one last thought for me anyway, that Fox should have taken the position like, look, this is the best thing ever happened to Dominion. We have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're amazingly accurate. Yes. Yes. Well, also, um, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is that Dominion did very well. Um, and that was going to be a potential sticking point in the damages part of the trial if it, if, it, if it got there, because Fox was planning on arguing like, look, you guys are doing better than ever. Like, what's what, what's show us the harm? So I think it would have been, I mean, uh, the, 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 the big. You should be paying us. <laughs> that's right. I mean, yeah. It's, well, that's that's Fox, right? They're pretty audacious. Well, except this time. My thanks to Jeremy Peters. We'll be right back with my conversation with the great Katie Porter. We met uh, in the summer on the set of uh, the Jimmy Kimmel Live. And thank you for joining me as a guest. And that was, I think, the day that Biden signed the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, was it not? I believe so. 
and some good stuff out of that. A lot of good stuff. And let's just remind people <laughs> what, what's in that. So the Inflation Reduction Act centers on bringing down the costs for Americans, particularly of energy and of creating American jobs. And so it does that through things like um, investing in the manufacturing of wind and solar here in the United States um, by making it more affordable for people to green their appliances, get, for instance, heat pumps to keep them cool. Heat um, pumps are great. Heat pumps are great, and I'm going to be buying one. So nobody is focusing more on the government delivering the the guidelines and the tax rebates and tax credits than I am because I live in California and it's routinely sometimes 90, 100 degrees here, and I do not have air conditioning. So a heat pump is really badly named because it will also keep you cool. It's it's magic. It does both, right? It, it does keeps both. you warm in the winter, like in Iowa where you grew up. And it keeps you cool in in the summer in, in California because because it works on the heat differential between the ground well below the surface and the air uh, outside the house. You see, they definitely have a PR problem here in California because they're called heat pumps. But so that's why it's important that we explain to people that they keep you cool. Um, so I'm excited to be getting one. So, you know, we're seeing the Republicans attack a lot of the Inflation Reduction Act and try to undo a lot of it. It's been sort of defensive of this first few months of Congress trying to hang on to those victories for the American people to bring down costs. And, and one, one of the pieces that's very popular is, of course, is on prescription drugs, allowing Medicare to negotiate on prescription drugs and insulin, capping it at $35. Uh, I noticed that uh, during the State of the Union, McCarthy applauded that. Yes. Wasn't that funny that how he applauded something he voted against? Then he then he wouldn't applaud when when Biden said, and we should do that for people under 65 or however he put it. And he wouldn't applaud that. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, as if it's OK to rip off people of a certain age, but not others. Yeah. Who need insulin. Right. Doesn't matter what age you are as a diabetic. If you're insulin dependent, you need that to stay alive. And you know, look, I think insulin is the sort of poster child for what's wrong with big pharma. But as you know, from all of the work you did in the Senate, it, it really is the, the tip of the iceberg. We have tremendous problems with EpiPens that have been well publicized. I think about all the kids who get yelled at when they lose their EpiPen because they cost hundreds of dollars for a family to have to buy a replacement. Um, but just generally, you know, the big pharma's sort of grip on Washington has been so strong. And the Inflation Reduction Act is really the first time um, in my lifetime that we have seen Washington really push back on big pharma and say, no, we're not going to listen to you and your bullshit. We're going to actually bring down the cost of prescription drugs and not allow Americans to get ripped off um, when the rest of the world gets a good deal on them. And so I, I think it's a turning point, not just for the costs that we pay as patients for drugs, but also for standing up to one of the most powerful lobbies in Washington. And I, I think it's there's a big victory there in the Inflation Reduction Act that sets the stage for further fights that we need to have with other special interests. And also on pharma, because uh, this really is about mainly protecting people on Medicare, as opposed to we pay about two to three times as much on pharmaceuticals as they do Elsewhere, I, in your book, I, I really enjoyed your book. In your in your book, uh, you talk about uh, you grew up in Iowa, and I grew up in Minnesota, so I want to talk a little bit about that. You grew up on a farm. I did. I grew up on a farm. I was a nine year four um oh, cool. and so showed cattle and pigs. How old were you when you between showed? nine and between nine and sixteen? Now let me ask you: uh, What was your first uh, animal you showed? My first animal I showed was a cow. Her name was Abby. She was it was a cow calf project, and the calf's name was Dan. And I chose that because your cow calf project comes home with you. It doesn't go to the slaughterhouse. And I was a, a oh. tender hearted nine year old. How big a operation? How, how many acres? We rented some of it. I mean, we probably had no oh, six hundred acres or so. Okay, um, some so of it was rented. Some of it was my grandfather. Some of it was my dad's. Um, okay. but we had about a hundred head of a hundred cows um, and a cow calf operation, and then we had lots of pigs, um, and we had a sort of farrow all the way to to slaughter pig operation. 
So mainly uh, livestock. Yeah, and then corn and soybeans and hay because you have to you have to feed the you have to feed the critters. Okay, and then uh, off to from there to uh, the east for college, and uh, I believe Yale uh, for undergraduate and Harvard, where you went to law school. Is that a good law school? I uh, it was a great law school, um, and but you know it's what you do with it. I mean, Harvard Law School has also produced some of the the greatest assholes of our time. So yes. You know, it, it's a it's a large law school and it, it, people do different things with the degree. So, you know, it's what you do with the legal education. You get there and it matters. And, but I feel grateful that I was able to go. I uh, met Elizabeth Warren there. She was my professor and went on to do research with her about families in bankruptcy. That is a, a big part of how you started, right? Was writing about families in bankruptcy at an opportune time uh, in what, 2007, uh, I think you published something at that time. Yeah, I started doing research on a lot of the research in the fight at the time. And, you know, in the, in the Senate was about whether we should make it harder for families to file bankruptcy and whether um, families, the debtors in bankruptcy, were sort of cheating the system, whether they were breaking the rules. And I did a study that kind of flipped the the lens on that and looked at whether or not the banks, whether the creditors in bankruptcy were following the rules. And it turns out they're, you know, as you would say, big fat liars. Um, and they were breaking the rules and cheating families. Um, they were failing to produce documents that showed that what they said they were owed was what they were actually owed. And they were taking people's homes, um, foreclosing on homes in violation of the law. And so this study came out in, in 2007, 2008, right as the global economy sort of exploded. And were you looking at subprime loans and uh, that kind of thing? Well, so the subprime loans were definitely where the sort of problem began in terms of lending to people who couldn't afford to pay it back. I mean, some some significant fraction of people who got a subprime loan never made a single payment on the mortgage because they never planned to. They were just told, oh, get this. And then six months later, you can refinance and you can refinance again and cash out. And um, But the real problem was the systems or the lack of systems that the banks had. The, the system was rigged in their favor. The sort of traditional rule is, you know, the bank's always right and the customer's always wrong. and they had convinced an awful lot of people that that was true. And so I think what my study showed is that, you know, when you look under the hood, um, it turns out that the bank is is always making sure the consumer pays the fees, whether they're owed or not. And so I think that led to ultimately gave fuel to a lot of the investigations that were going on of what the banks were doing and ultimately to the, the, the attorney general settlement across the country that I worked on here in California to try to make sure the banks actually changed what they were doing and improved their practices and, and started following the law instead of breaking it. And then there were these packages that were made up of very subprime and Oh, yes, because dicey. if something's terrible, if you package it together with a bunch of other terrible things, it somehow becomes better, right? I mean, that's the theory here. Like, your grandma doesn't give you one ugly pair of socks for Christmas. She gives you a six-pack. And so it's the same kind of theory <laughs> here, which is... You just take a bunch of ugly things together and maybe, you know, they become better. And and so that, you know, the effect on all of us was that what was happening on Wall Street was a money making machine for them on the backs of the rest of us. And the housing market, while it's stabilized, you know, and we're not seeing the foreclosures that we used to see, we are still today seeing Wall Street run our housing market to its advantage, gobbling up single family homes across the country and rental yep. properties across the country and making it impossible for people to buy homes. In my Senate campaign, I had an event up at UC Davis recently, and I about 70 students there, undergrads, grad students. UC Davis is a great university. I asked the students how many of them thought they would be able to buy a home. Not a single hand went up. Now, whether those students are a little too pessimistic or not, that is a serious political problem and a serious policy problem in a world where where you live determines so much else. Your safety, your educational opportunities, your savings for retirement. So we have big housing problems and Washington's you know, taking a pass and pointing the finger down at the state and local and county governments. And so a big part of the Senate campaign will be about going back to kind of my early work on housing and making that sort of a fundamental issue that uh, Washington needs to work on in, until it's better than it is today. 
And a lot of that has to do with the cost of college. Uh, yep. A lot of that has to do with California. Ronald Reagan kind of started the attack because back then you go to college at state universities free. He, he felt that that wasn't such a good idea. And so uh, in the uh, intro to the book, you talk about um, Stephanie Shriok. Who was your campaign manager? She she was great. She's my campaign manager. And uh, as you know, know because I I read it in Giant of the Senate. Oh, that's how. Okay, yeah. Let me just say that the, the very best political memoir is my book. I swear, politics is messier than my minivan. But the second best mm-hmm. political book is Giant of the Senate. And I, I took a lot of inspiration from your book because not just to write about Stephanie, who's an amazing political figure, but to sort of peel back the curtain a little bit on sort of the fact that Washington is so weird and politics is so messy that it is sometimes very, very funny. And it's OK to, to share that with the American people. Yeah, no, my uh, I was very proud part of that book uh still available al franken i now ironically uh titled al franken giant of the senate now you're a a single mom as i understand it correct correct i have three children they're 11 14 and 17 they're currently unsupervised on their spring break so we'll see if they're there when i get back 11 13 and 17 unsupervised does the 17 year old have some responsibilities there or i mean they all do because i'm a single mom and i'm in washington a lot so they have to help um and they you know they sometimes act very put upon but my we call my 14 year old um i call him lb for laundry boy he does all of the laundry Mm -hmm. um he does not fold however i have to do all the folding when i get home oh um, i thought you had fold, fold girl but uh my daughter does uh unloads the dishwasher um my Son takes out the trash and the recycling, so they all have different chores that they that they help do, um, along with you know the chaos that they generally contribute to the household. Well, uh, this begs the question: What do they eat? Um, so I do a lot of cooking before I leave for Washington. I so see, typically, I see. what I'll do is um, the day before I'll cook two dinners: one that we'll eat and one that I will freeze. And then the morning that I leave, I have to get. To leave for the airport about 6 a.m., 5, 5.50, um, to get to Washington for that night with a time difference. So I'll get up at about 4.30, and I will put something in the crock pot, um, the slow cooker, or I'll put something in the fridge that I'll have pre-made. So their only job is to turn the crock pot on and turn the crock pot back off. Um, okay. And then if I'm really lucky, when I get home from Washington three or four days later, somebody has washed the crock pot. If I'm not lucky, then I... I do that when I get home. You know, you teach a kid to cook. Yeah, your life improves. <laughs> yes, but then, then then they can cook for themselves. That's juggling a lot of stuff. That's juggling a lot of stuff. And it's juggling a lot of stuff. And a lot of a lot of uh, members of Congress don't have to do that. No, a lot of them are just hanging out, having you know drinks and you know, going to their penthouses in in the Navy Yard. But there's also a lot of people who live in rural areas and have long commutes. But I I am the only single parent of of school age kids in Congress. And, you know, it's it's not always easy. And I think one of the things people say is they want Congress members to be regular people. Um, And, you know, often I'm in the grocery store and people will say, oh, my God, I can't believe that you're here right? In the cereal aisle. And I, I want to say to these people, is there some other way to get Cinnamon Toast Crunch that I don't have to come here and buy boxes and boxes of it for my kids? There's only me. So if it's changing the oil or running an errand at the post office or going to the grocery store, it's you're going to see me in my minivan because it's only me and it's only the minivan. You know, when the pandemic happened and People, you know, the, the day I started worrying about what was going to happen to to kids and to parents and during the pandemic was the first day that the schools closed, because that was the first day it was a problem for me. <laughs> That's the way it works sometimes. Well, if there's only one single parent in, in the House or in Congress, maybe that may, it doesn't sound like it's enough to... Uh... Well, no, there's about 10 million single parents in the United States. And look, this this is not just about kind of 
you know, representation for its own sake. It's about seeing some of the policy problems. And so I'll, I'll give a, great, a concrete example. Um, Congress earlier last year passed um, the expanded child tax credit, which gave more right. money to families to help them afford to have a child, to pay, take care yep. of their child. Child care is really expensive, the cost of food, all of these things. And the qualification was you had to make less than $125,000 if you were single. And they doubled that to $250,000 if you were married. But here's the deal. Kids cost the same. Nobody gives you a discount at childcare because you're a single parent. And so the goal is to deal with the cost of a kid. So the tax credit should be set up the same, whether you're whether you're living in a grandparents or your parents are married or single or divorced or whatever, widowed. The same eligibility should come in based on the cost of a kid, not based on the whether your parents are married. And so I call this the single parent penalty. And when I asked the congressional staffers, like, why did you design it this way? We have to fix this. They said, well, actually, nobody's ever asked us before about single parents and, and how to think about the tax code in this way. That's a good anecdote about well, why true. it has the benefit of being have. true. <laughs> yeah. And also, yeah, if you're the only single parent there, no one asked us before. Well, that's 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 why. Now I I want to ask you about I, I heard you on another interview. You're for getting rid of the filibuster, which I, I believe I would get rid of the filibuster, but you're not sure? Well here's what I was thinking. The first week I was in the Senate uh, I had my boat on a Thursday night. I get taken the subway and I, I get on with a um, terrible guy uh, from Kentucky, the pitcher, Bunning, Jim Bunning. And I didn't know he was terrible. I said, Jim, see you on Monday. He said, I won't be here on Monday. We, we have a cloture vote. I don't have to be here. That means because we needed 60 votes to get cloture to on a, their filibustering. And this was stupid. And I talked to Norm Ornstein, you know, Norm. Well, Norm Ornstein and I have, have thought of a way to put the, the burden on those who are, are, are filibustering. Right now, Republicans can filibuster by just having one member object. And then Democrats have to get 60 votes to get cloture to end the filibuster. And if 41 of them had to show up and say, OK, uh, nope, we're, we're still filibustering. But they have to stay there and they have to debate it. They're not going to be there long. I, I do. I do think you're right that the way it's set up is sort of easy, very easy for people to, to sort of halt the wheels of government, which it's insane. It, one it person, one person has to say yeah. object and then then we need 60. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's ridiculous. That the, the wheels of government were never rolling that quickly in the first place. Um, and so to have one person be able to halt it is a real problem. You know, I don't know that the solution here is to move from having one person waste their time to having a bunch of people waste their time. I uh, no, I just think that the 41 wouldn't waste their time because if they had to stay there, let, let's say they have 49. That means they could only have eight off the floor at one time. That means they got to be there, each of them, you know, 19 hours a day or something. Right. That ain't going to last long. But also the majority doesn't want to waste that floor time. So I think people, they'd be more compromised. Maybe. I mean, look, compromise has been the holy grail of my five years in politics. It's it's pretty hard to compromise with Marjorie Taylor Greene. I'm, I'm just going to be honest. I know, I know. But when you have one house controlled by Democrats, like the Senate, and one house controlled by Republicans, the ha you know, the House, you're going to have to compromise. So let me ask you about the debt ceiling. Wow. What are you hearing in terms of anything that can make me feel better about this or how bad is this? Well, I, I'm I'm still hopeful that this is a lot of posturing um, and a lot of negotiating to kind of see what they can get sort of on the cheap, right, without having to to actually blow up the economy. I actually think this is a this is probably a, a first ever statement that's going to occur here on your podcast. I'm going to I'm going to just say it. Jamie Dimon, CEO of JP Morgan, is correct. 
everyone should negotiate to do the right thing on the debt ceiling. And so, you know, this is someone who I, I really enjoy roasting in front of Congress, and I, I wish he'd come back again soon. But on this one, I mean, when, when Katie Porter and Jamie Dimon are in agreement, then there's only one right answer, which is we have to raise the debt ceiling. This is about making sure that our economy stays strong and stable. And let me be straight with you. Nobody benefits not Republicans, not Democrats, not independents, nobody benefits when the economy is in the crapper. And in the crapper is, you know, as is is a technical term in economics, nobody benefits. And so I think that, you know, hopefully this is a lot of noise and there's not much behind it and we're able to, to come together and, and raise the debt ceiling. And then we can and should have a debate about what the budget looks like going forward. That is actually Congress's job and is well, fully it, appropriate. Is he saying we should raise the debt ceiling because we should raise the debt ceiling and then negotiate? Or is he saying that we should say, yeah, hey, we got to negotiate to raise the debt ceiling? That's when people are held hostage. That's what happened yeah. in 2011. And right now we're saying we are not going to be held hostage. You have to raise the debt ceiling. We're not going to negotiate based on you're going to go over the cliff. I mean, so I don't know what Jamie Dimon is saying exactly. Because those are very different things, right? They're yes, very, they are. Yes, yeah, they okay, are. okay. Yep. So look, I mean, I think the answer here is that you should raise the debt ceiling and yes. negotiate a budget <laughs> going forward. And I, I guess you're right that I don't know whether he's saying do the one and the other mixed together. I think President Biden, though, has been clear, and I think Americans should be clear, that there is no benefit to blowing up the economy over the debt ceiling. It doesn't right. make us better or stronger. It doesn't help us. If the only way you can win your argument to get the budget you want is destroying America's economy, then your arguments suck. And that's what I would say to Republicans. If, if they have good ideas about the budget, if they have good ideas about how to change government spending, then let them make those arguments on the House floor for next year's budget. Okay, but they're not going to do that, is what they're saying. They say a lot of things. Yeah, well, okay, but they're crazy. Kevin McCarthy than the also told me that he was going to be elected speaker on the first vote, you know? Okay, well, that you know, he wasn't smart. But uh, again, it, it makes a difference whether they say, okay, we'll raise the debt ceiling, then we'll negotiate, or... We'll negotiate unless you meet us. We're going to let the thing go over the cliff. Anyway, I, I guess enough of that. Uh, what what are, are your priorities going to be as a U.S. senator? Now, by the way, I've had Adam Schiff on. The, you're great. He's great. I'm just so pleased to have you on. You'd be a great senator. Well, thank you. I mean, look, I think the Senate race in California is a real opportunity for us to decide kind of what we want the democratic message and arguments and you know, engagement communications to be to help us win a durable majority for years to come. And so I think our party, you know, generationally and in terms of post-Trump, we need to figure out what arguments we're going to make to connect with voters and win tough races in every part and pocket of this country, including in California, which is key to winning the House. Um, and so, you know, I have a lot of experience winning tough races. Orange County was, mm -hmm. was very Republican territory when I ran. We've worked hard to register more Democrats and get more dumb people to vote Democratic. But what I bring to the race is an ability to, to know how to communicate across party lines. Nobody likes to get cheated, not Republicans, not Democrats, not independents. So I think standing up to corporations, and corporate power that are ripping us off is a really winning message. I think you heard President Biden do some of that in the State of the Union. And so I think thinking about kind of how do we set the Democratic message going forward, that's a big part of what this senator from California is going to do. They're going to have a huge platform to do it. On the substantive issues, my whole career has been about standing up to Wall Street, standing up to special interests. I don't take corporate PAC money. I don't take lobbyist money. I'm one of only a handful of people to not take either. Refusing those checks is an important part of how Democrats earn back the trust and credibility of everyday people. Um, and then I think the other big policy issue will flag is housing. The costs of housing are out of control in California, and we talked a little bit about that already, but I think we need federal leaders who put housing policy squarely at the center of our economic policy going forward. It's, it's, it's really the building block for so much else in our society. I think that's an issue that certainly across party lines, you could 
easily get agreement on. For example, I think that most Republicans believe we should raise taxes on high income people. Well, then why don't they do it? Because, I didn't say most Republican office holders. <laughs> there you go. There's that gap. Yeah. And I think most Republican office holders are holding the special interests. They do take corporate <laughs> yep. uh, money. They do take lobbyist money. And I, th I think Americans want to see more housing and costs go down. But especially uh, on, on taxes, we, we rip off the American people and the people at the very top skate. And that, I think, is something that Gee whiz, I, I think 80% of Americans agree on. Yep, I would agree with you on that. But, you know, there's still this gap between what Americans agree on, like, for instance, preventing gun violence, banning congressional stock trading, very both very popular things, and what Washington does. And I, I think, you know, that gap is driven in part by... Um, the influence of special interests in Washington by the influence of donors. It's also driven in part by gerrymandering and having districts that are more and more and more ideologically extreme. Yep. And I think, you know, coming from a purple place, both Iowa, where I grew up, Orange County, where I built my life, I think I, I have an understanding of how those kinds of purple districts help produce. And, you know, Minnesota was one of them when you ran. They help you have a good understanding of how to connect with Americans across party lines and how to fight for things that are broadly popular. Yeah. And part of that is finding those issues that people actually agree on across party lines. That's what I was trying to identify. Yep. What are some of the others of those? On things people agree on? Yeah, uh, across party lines. Again, I, I actually think that I think most Americans think it's insane that Bezos pays no taxes. I mean, they, yes, no of course they do. Of course they do, because he benefits from all of the things that we have in this country, like an educated workforce and infrastructure and all of those things. Oh, oh, oh here's another thing just on the IRS. OK, most Americans actually like the IRS. And Republicans voted against the increased IRS funding. The increased IRS funding is to go to be able to go after people, higher income people. I'm not talking about Bezos. I'm talking about people making five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars. Now, a higher, much higher percentage of people who earn under twenty thousand dollars are audited because it's easy to. And in the House. Republicans voted against Biden's plan in the Inflation Reduction Act to increase funding for the IRS. They, they can't repeal what, what was done in the, in the Inflation Reduction Act. But having more auditors, more sophisticated auditors, better technology, that's going to get yield us lots and lots and lots of tax dollars. No, oh, every dollar that we put toward having a an IRS that has the technology and the resources it needs to catch tax cheats, billionaire tax cheats, returns many, many dollars back to the government. And so it's a smart investment. One of the other things is people call my office and they they would like to be able to get tax help. They like they have questions and they'd like to be able to get someone on the phone at the IRS. And so to do that, you have to give them funding. And and they're doing a much better job of that this year because of the uh, uh, because the of the resources. So yes, that, right. Like government at work. When you set it up to work, it actually delivers. And you know the people who benefit from an, a broken IRS are the tax cheaters. They are not about democracy. That's what we're seeing. Look at Wisconsin, right? So we have this election, and the progressive wins in the Supreme Court election, and immediately they're talking about impeaching her because they can in in the legislature before she's even sworn in. Yeah, no, look, I mean, people who are elected, even people who are, shall we say, unusual, have an ability and a right to serve. And the solution, if you don't like those people, is to elect more people who think like you. It's to respect the democratic process and you know, I, I think to the extent that we're seeing state legislatures and judicial battles, Congress kind of move away from that. I think it's it's really dangerous and it's really harmful. So, you know, Democrats are going to win because we have we have better values and we are are better at governing and delivering what people need. That's what we need to be campaigning on um, is our winning ideas. 
And of course, abortion Dobbs came out of this court that I consider illegitimate. Well, it's certainly a corrupt court. And we we know that. I mean, Senator Whitehouse, Sheldon Whitehouse talks a lot about wrote a really good book about the corruption of the Supreme yep. Court. And then we see that, you know, yes, Justice Thomas is running around on yachts and helicopters and planes and God knows what else and taking money, you know, taking these fancy trips. And, and while he's on these trips, by the way, meeting with people whose primary job and life objective is to reshape the, the bench to deliver things that extremists want, um, including a ban on abortion. And so it's an egregious example of what I think is sort of constantly operating in the background for the last several decades, which is a hijacking of the judiciary by right-wing extremists. And it's it's being done through the influence of, of money on the court. Yeah, dark money, uh, which was unleashed by Citizens United which would be nice to reverse if we can ever get that done. But that's going to be hard when they've stolen. The, yeah. The and, seats. and in the meantime, in the meantime, until we get Citizens United reversed, I think it's important that we do two things. One is shine as much of a light as we can on the influence of money. And I think that's where, you know, disclosure. And I think that's where the, the work that, for instance, Senator Whitehouse has done to show how all these Friends of the court amicus brief, they look like they're these little independent grassroots organizations, but they're all really connected and through a a gigantic Republican um, slush fund funded by billionaires. And then also to change our own behavior. With Citizens United blocks some of the legislative paths to campaign finance reform, but nobody makes you take corporate PAC money. Nobody makes you take lobbyist money. You can make the decision like I did to refuse federal lobbyist money, to refuse corporate money, to refuse money from you know people who work at big oil and big banks and big pharma. And that's something that I think every Democrat, every, every elected official in my mind, Democrat or Republican really should be doing and, and changing the norms and expectations about who we fight for. Well, I'm going to form a, a, a dark money group, independent uh, PAC that you don't know about to support you. <laughs> no, no, no comments. Yeah, we're not coordinating at all here. No, definitely. I would never. Yeah, uh, I just put up, uh, you know, some videotape of yourself uh, doing things like, you know, cooking for your three kids, uh, put them up on the web. And then uh, I might they may end up in my 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 uh, independent expenditure commercials. Of you. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we uh, we recently uh, wrote to some of our supporters and we showed them the calendar that I make to kind of tell my kids what's going on when I go out of town. Right. Well, that's you know, a good going item on after school. This is going on. Make sure you remember to do this. Don't forget that, you know, Betsy has water polo and Paul, you know, you have this birthday party and this and that, and, you know, plug in the crock pot and throw out the, you know, the food that's rotten. And we, we offered to send people some of my recipes um, that I use to keep these children fed when I'm away in Washington. And we have, you know, tens of thousands of people who wanted these recipes. So, you know, there's some, there's some good Midwestern uh, potluck dishes in there. What's a, what's a good Midwestern dish you make? Um, my mom makes this thing that she calls country club potatoes. But, you know, the recipe starts okay. with a whole stick of butter mm-hmm. and then it just kind of goes downhill from there. It's sort of a hash brown casserole. And that, that's that's really tasty. So it starts with a stick of butter and it ends with some crunched up cornflakes. That is truly delicious. Mm, that's good Midwest eating. Yeah. Well, you know, in the Midwest, dishes come in in four sizes. Small, medium, large, and funeral size. And funeral size is, you know, what you take to the church basement when there's a when there's a death to share with your your grieving. Neighbor. I see. I thought it uh, it kills you, but no, no. no. I no. see funeral size is yes. What you take to the church basement? Yep. Yeah, Lutheran. Did you grow up Lutheran? What I up? I did. My my mom's family was Lutheran, um, and my dad's family was Methodist. So a lot of church basements in my background. Yeah. And weak coffee. Do they make really weak coffee in Lutheran churches in in Iowa? Because they do in Minnesota. I I think the Midwest church scene is not known for its it's, you know, cold brew. Well, no, what they do, the whole point is so you can drink coffee all day. Yeah, you can just sort of sip it all day. That's in Minnesotans. (laughs) Uh, This is me growing up. Growing up, it's gotten better. 
but it was uh, church uh, coffee is uh, and, and uh, Lutheran coffee is just uh, you know you p- keep it in the thermos and you drink it all day. You see, yeah, you you just it's it's the elixir of life. So where in Iowa did you where was your farm? Where was it? Um, south about an hour south of Des Moines, between um, okay. Des Moines and the Missouri border. I lived on a farm about a mile outside of town that. Um, when I was little, had about a thousand people in it. And now has about three hundred. So um, there's a little bit of a the story of of what's happened in rural America there. Yeah, yeah. It needs some manufacturing there, huh? Make some uh, wind turbines and yeah, exactly. We other... get some manufacturing and some some jobs back there, and invest in family farming again. And I think one of the big fights you're going to see this year in Congress is the farm bill is up for reauthorization. And, you know, we call it the farm bill, but it's really the corporate agriculture bill. You know, those corporate agricultural conglomerates are some of the the biggest and most powerful forces in Washington. And so, you know, one of the things I'm focused on is thinking about how can we make sure that we're making food that that people should eat and want to eat, including kids, cheaper. Um, And that means, you know, why does only 4% of farm subsidies go to fruit and vegetables? Right. Um, and they're really, you know, I tell my kids all the time, they say, can we get those raspberries? Absolutely not. Those raspberries cost $8, put them right back down. Um, right. And so I think that parents should be able to say yes to their kids wanting fruit and vegetables um, and be able to, to have that in their homes and to serve that. And and Congress makes policies that that make it let make fruits and vegetables expensive and make sugar um, and meat cheap. And I think that, that mm-hmm. we need to change that. Absolutely. Boy, that's um, not said enough. Uh, When's the primary there? Primary is 11 months from now. It is March 5th of 2024. So it's, you know, 11 months is coming up. You got a lot of work to do. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, I I think I have about 39 million doors to knock. So I, I probably better get going. Yeah, I guess you better get going. But, you know, uh, you might want to get some corporate money to buy uh, airtime. Absolutely. No corporate money. Not ever. <laughs> never have done it. Never going to. And, you know, look, I uh, I think you win by doing the work. And I, I think that's and, and really showing people you understand what it's like to be them and to uh, to have the, the concerns they have about their kids. And, you know, part of that's part of the reason that I think I named the, you know, I wanted the minivan to be in the title of the book because, you know, people are always like, I can't believe you actually have a minivan. And I'm like, my God, is there any other way to get these three children where they need Why to Why wouldn't you have a minivan? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the, <laughs> right, you, right. Can, uh, you can go, uh, you can buy the book. Um, we have a link on our website, katieporter.com. And um, you can read all about my adventures in campaigning, and including in the van. Thanks for joining us, uh, for joining me here, and also for joining me on Kimmel. That was, uh, people love that. And they can actually go and see that, that, that interview. That was uh, kind of nice. It's on uh, what you call your YouTube. You see, uh, they, they, they. I think they just call it YouTube. I don't think that the youths call it the YouTube or your YouTube. Yeah, yeah. I'm just being. I'm just uh, you know being Minnesotan. It's there you on, go. It's on your YouTube. Yeah, yeah. It's like my grandma once told me she'd like me to have a computer that has the internet inside. <laughs> these are some real these are some real midwestern values so oh yeah well um, no you know you just tell her it's connected to it yeah yeah so oh, well. um, thank you so much al katie thank you take Good care luck to you you too well i i hope you enjoyed uh listening that beautiful music is by leo kotke the great leo kotke i want to thank peter ogburn for producing this podcast We'll talk again next week. Mm